Ah, the magical world of Disney. So much goes on off stage and behind the scenes to ensure that the guests have the most magical times of their lives once they arrive on the property. Ever seen a wet paint sign while walking through the parks? How about a maintenance cast member with a, a bag of tools? I mean, anyone with a construction hard hat? Of course you haven't. That would ruin the experience that Walt Disney World is perfection. It's because of that 99.99% of all work goes on after the show is over. All the little mice that keep the place running like clockwork don't even start working until the announcement is made over the radios that the park is now clear. Then the crews get to work. Maintenance starts buzzing around in their golf carts. The custodial cast members bring out their large hoses to wash down every inch of the streets, the ones that we all walk on, and the construction crews are allowed past the security perimeter gates to come in and do whatever needs to be done. And that's where my story begins. See, I worked construction most of my life. When work dried up up north, I moved to Florida, where some of my family had moved over ten years ago. And naturally, I needed to find a job. I wound up applying for and getting hired by a construction company that shall remain unnamed. One that literally did almost all the construction needs for the corporate mouse. I spent five or six overnights a week at various locations at Walt Disney World with co-workers, we weren't employed by Disney, hence we were not cast members, doing whatever our foreman told us needed to be done. Sweet gig, actually, even though it was very hard work at times. Just, I mean, just think, how many people can truly say they get to ride around the Magic Kingdom, the Animal Kingdom, etc., in the dead of night, in trucks, golf carts, what have you, while the park's just about empty, <laughs> except for the skeleton crew? For about the first six months, I kind of kept to myself, except for talking with the crew of the company that I work for. Then I began to notice how chummy some of the Disney overnight crew was with our staff. And custodians, when working on the same areas as us, would come over and talk to the boys as well as the overnight security cast members. I began to slowly get to know many of these folks as well. They, for the most part, were really nice. I got to know many of the night security staff, by face at least, at all four parks as well as the resorts. If you didn't know, Walt Disney World opened in 1971. It was actually not too uncommon to come across someone who had been a lifer with Disney, or knew someone who at least was, 40 plus years working for the mouse. God bless him. Even my foreman, who although did not work directly for WDW, was one of these. Boy, they have some stories to tell to pass the time. As, as I adjusted more to the job, I began to get more comfortable with the surroundings, you know? Cast members grew more social towards me, and I was able to make my way through the parks without getting, without getting lost. <laughs> Let me tell you, that's not easy when you first start working there, especially at night. Although it's not pitch black, there's very minimal lighting except for where we put our floodlights up to be able to do work. Security's only using flashlights or headlamps or their carts to light the way, you know? And store lights are only on if somebody's working in them. It's quite eerie, you know, yet cool at the same time, you know? Like a totally different place than during the operating hours. As a matter of fact, one time, when I decided to visit the park as a guest, I couldn't find a ride that I wanted to go on because it, it just looked so different during the day with all the colors, people, sounds, music. One year working at the place full time and I had swallowed my stupid pride and go get a map. <laughs> it's pathetic, right? Anyway, as I, as I started conversing more and more with the cast members, some of the security staff and I found out that we had a mutual interest in the paranormal. Of course, that would come up in conversation eventually when working in graveyard shifts, you know? Well, I would get to hear stories from them all the time. The famous ghost of the Pirates of the Caribbean ride, the, the murder or suicide in one of the rooms of the certain resorts, the jumping off of a terrace at another, ghosts of cast members who passed on come back to say hi. The spooky occurrences at rides where some unfortunate guest was killed. Stories went on and on. Although fun to hear, I won't lie, it did give the whole property an ominous feel at times that a guest will never get to experience. I mean, even co-workers of mine had stories to tell. Attractions turning on even though the lockout tagout system is in place to ensure that they don't. 
allowing someone to break a room and walking in to find no one is there. And of course, the noises and the voices when they're working alone. And Ghost Hunters jackpot. So several months ago, when arriving at work, the foreman called our team over for a meeting. He announced that he'd be starting a new assignment in the Magic Kingdom shortly, and we'd be working on the Seven Dwarves Mine Train ride. This attraction would be opening later on in the year. I mean, how exciting, right? Up until now, my crew, since I had started with them, had been doing mundane, I mean, yet necessary assignments. We had the pleasure of pouring concrete, digging ditches, fixing bathrooms, you know, good stuff. And now we're actually going to be working on an attraction. Imagine me getting to tell my future wife and children that I helped make this as we were writing it. They'd be in awe, and they'd be so proud, and the building was already up for the most part. We were going to be working on making it show-ready. You know, making a building look like a mine inside and out. Fabricating rocks, uh, fixating jewels, the works. When the time came to start this, he had us meet inside of the cast member break rooms inside the attraction. For those of you that don't know, most, if not all, attractions have break rooms inside of them that the public can't see. Cast member working the ride literally doesn't have to leave it, you know, if he or she doesn't want to, even for a lunch break. He explained the job, you know, who would be doing what each week, and all the normal details. Then he proceeded to tell us that as per Disney management, we were to take our lunch breaks at 3 o'clock a.m. and to only take it in this particular break room that we were in. Now, I thought that was kind of weird. You know, since my employment with them began, we were never told when and where to take our lunch. We used to always stagger our breaks as well as so that most of the crew was always working. Whatever, I guess. The mouse paid our bills. Who the hell was I to question it? I was still the rookie, you know, but I was... I will say this. I saw what I was thinking in the eyes of my co-workers as well. We were only a group of ten guys on this assignment. We were broken up into groups of five. One group would work on the outside, one group on the inside of the attraction. I was in the inside group. It was a pain to work in the thing, you know, due to the size of the spaces where we had to work. Maybe one or two floodlights would fit in the area where we were working. It gave an effect of staring into a fire in the woods. While working in a wall, it was bright as hell. When you came out of that space, you were blind as a bat. The first few days, it became a, a running joke or a contest of who tripped on something and broke their ass the most each week. And they'd have to pay for drinks when we went out together. I paid up twice the first month. Yeah, thanks, Disney. I guess you could call me paranoid. But I would never leave my lunch bag in the fridge in the break room. See, I'm I'm an absolutely angry asshole if I'm hungry. After having it stolen once, well, at Animal Kingdom, I'm not going to have it happen again. So I carry it around with my other gear from then on. We were working on the opposite side of the attraction from the break room. It was just, it was just about lunchtime. You know, we cleaned up all the possible trip hazards we went on break. Then, when we got to the break room, I realized I'd left my bag where we were working. I mean, damn it, I'm not going to spend $8 on a Coke and a stupid bear claw from one of the Disney rip-off vending machines. So I told the guys, I'm going to run back to get my bag. So off I went. I was hurrying along because we only had about a half an hour for lunch. And if we take even a minute longer to get back to our work location, there's hell to pay. And you all know how fast a half hour flies by, unless you're working. Now, trying to make good time, I must have made a wrong turn in all the blackness. A stupid flashlight was in my tool bag, of course. I was attempting to feel my way around the track when I saw some light coming up ahead of me. They looked like they'd be a set of emergency lights, but they were quite dim and flickering. I mean, who cares? Any port in a storm, right? So I slowly made my way towards them and began to hear voices. But, but I couldn't make out any words. Well, there was no one in the attraction other than us, or so we were told. So, oh my God, you know? And after all the stories I was told, was I finally going to have one of my own? As much as I felt the hairs in the back of my neck stand up, I was excited as well. Even though I really like hearing about ghosts, I can't say that I really truly afraid of them i just don't want them in my home <laughs> other than that i find the idea of them fascinating you know and so i i slowly peeked my head around the next corner and i wish to god 
Yeah, it was a ghost I saw. It was a large, at least compared to where we were working, open space, and there was a fabricated stone slab made to look like a natural rock formation in the center. Six figures in suits were around it in a circle. Five were holding candles, while one was reading off of what looked like an old piece of parchment. What he was saying was beyond my knowledge. Not English, from what I could tell. Every time the main suit would finish a sentence or two, the others would repeat the last word. And as I crouched there, amazed, I saw what looked like a, a flash of yellow and blue stirring from on top of the altar. There was something on it. A woman. She stirred again. I, I thought my eyes were playing tricks on me. It looked like one of those those college program kids. The ones that get to uh, be friends with the characters. Completely dressed as Snow White. She was gagged and bound. What the hell was I seeing? Her eyes were huge, filled with fright. Tears were streaming down her face, making her overly done makeup run. As much as she struggled, she could barely move. The man of the parchment stopped reading. The others all produced some crudely made daggers and made their way to her. Two of them went to each of her arms, two of her legs, and one stood at the top of her head. The leader, for, for lack of a better word, made a gesture with his hands and said one more uncomprehensible word, and the others moved in. The two by her arms sliced her arms from bicep down to wrist. The two did the same for the mid-thigh and the top of her feet. The fifth one actually carved what looked like a half-moon into her forehead. I stifled a scream and I closed my eyes. I could hear muffled screams and I could smell copper in my nostrils and taste it in the back of my throat. I opened up my eyes briefly to see the leader produce a knife, walk over to the altar, and lift poor Snow White's chin up towards him. And that's when I turned and ran. I got back to the break room, sprinting through the door. I must have looked half crazed because one of my buddies said, What the hell happened to you and where's your lunch bag? I didn't even answer him. I just stood there. He looked me over one more time and decided to call the foreman over the radio. One happened to come over and talk to me. The foreman came in, took one look at me, and asked if I was feeling okay. I shook my head. He told me to go home for the remainder of my shift. I called off for the next three days. In the comfort of my home, I attempted to rationalize what had happened. You know, it, it had to have been a gag, right? Anyway, was it my boys with an elaborate welcome to the crew trick? I, I mean, God. I, well, Disney World is crammed full of college program kids, right? So late teens, early 20s, away from home, on college, getting paid crap just so they could... They could put Disney on the resumes, just fornicating and causing havoc every chance they get, playing tricks so they can put it in their blogs or their Twitter or whatever stupid thing they use to get attention, right? It had to be. So my first night back to work, I literally had to force myself not to turn my car around at the security gate when the guard opened it for me to enter. When I get to the break room, one of the lifers I worked with was sitting there, seemingly waiting for me. They told me to clock in leave my stuff with him, and go meet the foreman over by the main entrance. I looked at him quizzically, since it was, it was pretty far away from the mine, and it was heavily frowned upon for us non-cast members to be found wandering far from where we were assigned. I stated as such, and he just said, Go, you'll be with your boss, so it would be his ass and not yours if someone says something. So I made my way over to the main entrance. I found him under the train station. He's sitting on one of those benches. He told me to sit. Wait there for about five minutes. He lit up a cigarette. And, uh, I did as well. I mean, during the night shift, you could get away with this if you're careful about it. And he asked me what had happened the other night. I shrugged. I looked to the newly hosed down ground and I... I felt exhausted. He put his hand on my shoulder and he said that I was a great co-worker. The other guys all liked me a lot. He didn't want to lose me. 
and that he was surprised I came back after the way I'd looked. I told him that it wasn't far from the truth. He asked me if I was just sick or if something had happened. He also asked me if maybe a cast member manager had given me a hard time, and if so, he'd handle it. I shook my head. They said that he wouldn't believe me. He'd probably fire me for being a nut if I told him. And then he said something that made me feel like it was okay to tell my story. He said, I've worked here since it was just flat land and dirt roads. Nothing you can say will shock me. So I looked up at him and I looked him dead in the eyes. And when I saw that he was telling the truth, I began to explain everything from the beginning. I ended the story when the other guy told me to come see him. My foreman sat there, flicked his cigarette butt, ground it into the floor. It was a huge Disney no-no. He had sat there nodding through the entire story, not interrupting once. Never, never once a smirk, a smile, a look of disbelief. A custodial truck happened to drive by, and when the headlights flashed on us, it seemed that all the blood had seemed to drain from my foreman's face. He breathed in and exhaled once from the mouth. At the beginnings of tears rolling in his eyes, he finally spoke. I'm about to tell you, kiddo, not many here have been here long enough to know, and those who do know almost never speak about it. It's sort of a taboo subject, and the few that do talk about it are too old to care or have one too many scotches. He smiled half-heartedly at this, and I thought maybe he might stop, but he continued. I've lived in this area for almost 80 years. I've barely been out of this state. Less times that I can count on one hand. The land has only looked this way for a short time. If you could have seen this land in the time I grew up here, you would be amazed. Marshland, orange groves, nothing else. Until Uncle Walt decided that this would be his spot for his next incredible theme park, there was practically nothing. Humans have been inhabiting this land for a very long time. The eyes, the Apache, the Calusa, the Temuqua, all native Indians that lived in or around the land that you're sitting in right now. The Paleo Indians were here before them. You know, ancient land. Uh, I'm no historian. But I guess them Indians at some point figured out that this land was a little spoiled. Spoiled as in not just bad, but spoiled as in how a little child throws a tantrum if it doesn't get its way. You know, at some point, when these cultures were not having good weather, or crops, what have you, they figured out that a blood sacrifice, well, a blood sacrifice could do the trick. And every time they built a large structure in this area, they drew blood. But for whatever reason, sacrifice had to do with the structure being built. And for example, if the Indians were building a religious structure, the shaman had to be sacrificed. If a settler was building a barn or an orange grove, a farmhand had to be the one. You get me? And it had to be done by the elders of the town. It couldn't be done by just anyone. But the elders are the most influential ones in the area. I mean, have you seen that movie? It's a pet cemetery, the one by Stephen King. Like that, you know, but the, but the important people involved. Do you know the story about how Disney bought this land? He bought it not under the Disney brand, but hundreds of pseudo companies. He didn't want anyone to know he was going to build a theme park here, because the locals may not have sold it as cheaply as they did. So he did what he did. And I, I wonder if, through all this half-truth bargaining, if him, his round-table executives... Have they ever wondered why so many were willing to sell at that price? Were they done having to do the despicable to make a profit here? Did so many of them want out? It could really make you wonder. How come supposedly no one dies at Disney? How come all people are proclaimed dead off the property? Why do, why do we hire so many college kids that are supposedly running rampant here? Think about it. 
I just gotta tell you because I think I think you may deserve it after what you've seen. The powers that be here, they're powerful. More powerful than being Disney executives. They pretty much rule everything. You think Club 33 is exclusive? <laughs> the club you stumbled upon rules more than just a theme park. If you think about what you've seen, your life may be in danger. And if you talk about what you've seen, your life may be in danger. I just sat there trying to soak in what I just heard. This was insane. And then my foreman said one more thing before the last sentence I ever said to that nice man. If you think that was bad, just imagine what I heard as we were building the small world. I swear I still hear those screams of those kids when I close my eyes. So even 40 years after. My reply? I quit. <sighs> the magical world of Disney. I still get the shakes when I think about it. I hate every fucking Disney commercial that comes on TV. And they come on a lot. I get goosebumps every time. I see Universal's hiring. And I do need work. Should I apply? Hey there, kids. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and we've just started off 2021, hopefully pretty well here. It's been 10 years now since the channel's gotten started, and since then, man, we've kind of done a shit ton. If you'd like to check out more of what I've done, you can always follow me at twitch.tv slash Mr. Creepypasta to hear me recording live and where I talk kind of at length about myself and my life. And I want to give a very special thank you to all of you who support me on Patreon. Because, quite honestly, you guys help me keep the lights out of my house. And I can't thank you enough for that. A very special thank you to Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Canon Lando Higuchi, Chumbinski, Bobby Carmen, Nico Kyle, Tristan Pelton, Chase Burnett, Deanna Krause, G. Weevil 3, Chris Lovin, Freddy Krueger, Dr. Stein and Mr. Happy, Miranda Jeffries, Hal Gungshi, Justin Johnson, Raven Hart, Unknown Nobody, Michael Scarborough, Kazen, this is my real name, no shit, Jason V.B. Wilson, Infernal One, Jimbo the Hutt, Caspian, Jordan Nels, Hades Nephew, Jordan Wayne Deckard, Acid System, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Cryptic Nightmares, Someone You Love, S-Man, Kiri the Sloth, Liam Newman, Sky Harbor, Caleb Dougal, Nina Smith, Raphael Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Paulson, and Corey Kenshin. Thank you guys so much. Like, seriously. Thank you guys so, so much. And if you would like to be able to join them, you always can at patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta. I love you guys. Seriously. All of you who support on Patreon, who follow, who subscribe, those of you who listen, and those of you who lurk, Thank you for the amazing 10 years and sweet dreams. <laughs>